Welcome to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life. My name is Tracy Crow. I'm an author, writing coach, and Marine Corps veteran. I'm looking forward to co-creating today's show with you. So if you're ready, are you ready? I'm ready. So if you're ready to live a more creative, more magical life, let's get started. Thank you for returning to part two of this week's series about the value of owning and writing our personal stories. If you'll recall from episode 18, I shared how I'd left the Marine Corps with an honorable discharge, but under conditions that had felt far less than honorable. I carried the disappointment, regret, shame, guilt, and post-traumatic stress of identity crisis for nearly 15 years. Thanks to a gifted writing professor who encouraged, or practically ordered, me to write about my military experiences, I began to more fully understand the motivations behind various life decisions, and why one day, after a lifetime of right turns, I suddenly turned left, down a path that would eventually cost me a marriage and a military career. Thanks to writing, I discovered all the pivotal moments in my life beginning in early childhood and all the meaningful patterns that began forming and shaping who I thought I was or who others expected me to be. The journey of self-discovery, for me anyway, was a painful one. And I was never certain as I wrote those earliest drafts that I could, would, or should ever publicly reveal any of my life story. One day, a former brother-in-law who knew I was writing a memoir for my master's thesis blurted, What makes you think anyone cares about your life story anyway? I'd felt the flush of embarrassment under that stinging rebuke and under the wide-eyed stares from the rest of my extended family who had stopped what they were doing to hear my response. I had muttered something like, "Uh, maybe no one but me will care. I'm writing mostly for myself. But I also knew my former brother-in-law had a point. After all, I was no one famous. I wasn't a cast member of any real housewife reality series. I had no serious platform from which to launch. All I had was my story. The lessons I was still gleaning from it, too, and a sudden compelling calling to share my story with the world, however small that world audience might become. What my brother-in-law hadn't realized that day, at least not consciously, is that he'd gifted me with a valuable insight. And the gift was this. I owed my reader total honesty. Total, clear-eyed honesty. Which meant I had to first become totally honest with myself. So I went back to work on the memoir, uncovering more truths about the various pivotal moments that led toward life-changing decisions. The result was this. When the memoir, released on April Fool's Day 2012, and an excerpt appeared on AOL HuffPo under an incredibly salacious headline that attracted hundreds and hundreds of slut-shaming comments, I discovered that I'd become Teflon. That's it. I was Teflon. I read every single comment and in doing so had made the discovery that not one of them was triggering a defensive reaction. Not one of them was triggering the old emotions of shame or guilt or regret. Because their negativity was a response to a younger version of me who no longer existed, a version of me I'd come to understand, uh, more importantly, forgive. And this was when I discovered the value of self-reflective writing. And this is why I'm so passionate about sharing my writing methods with others, especially with those who are suffering from trauma, moral injury, self-worth issues, addictions. 
So if you'll recall from episode 18, Professor Helen Wallace had encouraged me to write about my military story for her memoir class. Only I wasn't ready to write that story, you know, the most painful part of my story about my military life, the story I'd never intended to tell anyone, ever, including my daughter, so I had to decide what military story I was willing to share with my writing workshop peers at a private liberal arts college. So I began this way. I began by creating a simple timeline of my 10 years in the military. To create this timeline, I drew a horizontal line across a blank sheet of paper. Now imagine, on the far left, I wrote the year 1977, the year I joined the Marine Corps. On the far right, I wrote 1987, the year I left the Marine Corps. Between these two dates, I began ticking off pivotal moments of my 10-year career, the joyful pivotal moments, such as the birth of my daughter Morgan in 1980, and the not-so-joyful pivotal moments. And by pivotal, I mean life-changing in some way. When I taught memoir, many years later, the college freshmen, they would often lament in the first class that they hadn't acquired enough life experience to write memoir or personal essays. But after they created their timelines, which began for them with their first memory, often around the age of four, and ended with their current age and college status, they were stunned to discover just how much life experience they had already accrued. So many pivotal moments, some rooted in the dendrites of memory because of trauma, others filled with joy because of a goal accomplished despite all odds. For one student, a pivotal moment had been the loss of innocence in elementary school when a friend tragically died in an accident. For another student, a pivotal moment occurred after he lost a spot on the high school football team. For another, a pivotal moment had been a family divorce. Another cited the onset of a personal illness. For others, sexual assaults by a neighbor or family member made the timeline. For one student, it was the loss of a grandfather in that first experience of attending a funeral. Even the losses of beloved pets appeared along timelines, as did, of course, my students' first encounters with mind-altering substances. But so many life experiences by 18 or 19, and so many early patterns to examine. When I was working through drafts of my memoir, Eyes Right, I realized that in addition to creating a timeline of my 10-year military career, I needed to create a timeline around my childhood so that I, too, could uncover and examine the earliest patterns or scripts that had become adopted. I found it fascinating to discover that my reactions or certain lessons learned from childhood experiences were the motivations behind many of the decisions I'd made as a young adult. Remember, I didn't start this self-discovery process until my early 40s, but once I did, I was hooked. I was able to see clearly what I'd been carrying around with me for decades and what I no longer wish to carry with me in the forthcoming decades. Talk about liberation. I had permission, self-permission, to replace old patterns with new ones, new patterns I was choosing from a deeper, broader level of self-awareness. Remember episode six with a lone survival series star, Carly Fairchild, and how Carly uses the art of basketry as a metaphor for determining and creating new life patterns? We can do this. You can do this. But the process begins first with fully understanding who you are and what you are based on previous or current patterns. Patterns that once uncovered may begin to feel uncomfortable, as if you're walking around in a pair of shoes that pinch. Keep going, and you may eventually feel as if those shoes aren't worth the pinch. Toss them. Some of us discover we've been attempting to walk around this physical experience in a pair of shoes that feel as if they were formed for someone else's feet 
and walking habits. Yeah, you know how I love metaphor, right? I think you get what I'm trying to say here. So here's an example. Recently, I was assisting a writer with her memoir that's a coming of age in a war zone. At what point the writer, well, let's refer to her as the narrator, laments that her femininity pales beside that of another woman's. But nothing in her manuscript up to this point alerts us, the readers, as to why the narrator feels this way about herself. So I encouraged her to create a timeline related solely to her pivotal experiences related to personal appearance. Under what circumstances, I asked, did she begin to form her identity about physical experience? That she was somehow less feminine, for example, than anyone else? What are the pivotal moments, I asked her, positive and negative? When she does this work, she'll not only have created a more meaningful memoir for her readers, she'll also have a deeper understanding of her self. But what I hope most of all is that this process will lead her to a deeper self-love as it did for me. You see, I wondered too, as I was writing my own memoir, how I'd formed certain negative perceptions about my own physical appearance and why it was so difficult to accept or even believe a compliment. So I went to work. I created a separate timeline that ticked off every pivotal moment from early childhood to young adulthood, and wow, wow, the self-discoveries were mind-blowing. I was able to pinpoint the exact moment when my entire perception of myself as it related to physical appearance spun a 180 degrees. This 180 degree spin occurred in the fourth grade. I guess I was about nine and the whole class had been marched to the library for one of those mandatory eye examinations. We looked into a device that resembled a microscope and read off the letters to a nurse who was recording our results. So when it was my turn, I stepped up, looked into the device and stared into the bright white light waiting for the letters to magically appear. The nurse said, Go ahead, read the smallest line you can see. I waited, waited. What do you see, the nurse said. Nothing, I said. The nurse nudged me aside. She peered into the device and said, You don't see any lines of letters? She motioned for me to try again. I leaned over and stared hard into that pool of bright white light. No, ma'am, I said, and I'll never forget the look on her face. She took me by the elbow and guided me back to the classroom. Since my seat was in the last row, most of my classmates were already back in their seats. The nurse announced to my teacher, to everyone, that I was legally blind. My sweet teacher offered a hundred apologies, and all my things from the back row desk somehow appeared on a desk in the front row. My classmates giggled over what appeared to be a punishment, something highly unusual for their friend Tracy, the teacher's pet. Tracy, who was presented every day at lunch with ice cream gifts, presented by boys in class and by boys in grades much higher than Tracy's. Tracy, who was always designated as the lead in every school play or event because she was the prettiest girl. This level of popularity came to a crashing end a week or so later when I appeared in school wearing a pair of black cat-like glasses with lenses thick as the bottom of Coke bottles. I was shunned at lunch. The gifts of ice cream disappeared. Even my own grandmother would insist I remove my glasses when she introduced me to friends, saying she used to be so beautiful before these glasses. One day, she'd taken me shopping for a dress she wanted me to wear to the wedding of a friend's daughter. I emerged from the dressing room and stood in front of the three-way mirror. The sales lady oohed and awed as did my grandmother, 
and then apparently noticing my lack of response, the sales lady asked how I thought I looked in the dress. I don't know, I said. I can't see myself. My grandmother laughed and fished my glasses from her purse so that I could finally see my reflection. So you see, it's moments like these seemingly harmless in childhood that take root and form new patterns of identity, self-esteem, self-awareness, whatever you wish to call it. And these patterns will shape or distort an entire lifetime until we uncover the root cause, the aha, I see how and when and where this seed was planted and I see all that's been cultivated ever since. Now I'm choosing to plant a new seed and I'm going to lovingly nurture that seed every day with rich nutrients until it's thriving toward the sun with unstoppable growth. So let's say that you have created a timeline for yourself. You've chosen your childhood perhaps, or you've chosen to create a timeline about parenthood or career choices or spiritual experiences. So now what? This is where viewing your life through the lens of a storyteller becomes helpful because writers or storytellers in general understand that every story contains a level of conflict or tension. And the four basic levels of storytelling conflict are these. Person versus self. Person versus person. Person versus nature, such as fires, natural disasters, or whatever Mother Nature in general wants to throw at us. And person versus society and ideas, such as religious concepts or other societal ideologies. In a writing workshop, I encourage writers to choose a pivotal moment on their timeline. Eh, just choose one for now, I say, and identify the various levels of conflict. Most pivotal moments in our life contain at least two, usually person versus self, and one other. Could be another person, or a battle against Mother Nature, or a battle against societal concepts. Some pivotal moments will even include all four levels of conflict. And in fact, I include several of these in my memoir, Eyes Right. Once we identify the levels of conflict, we begin free writing about them. Just free writing for self-discovery. No care about a critic over the shoulder or grammar or spelling. Just free writing. All about what can we remember about the events leading up to and immediately following that pivotal moment, for example. What details today perhaps feel blurry about that pivotal moment? Which details are still playing on a mental mind loop? And hmm, knowing what we know today about ourselves and others who co-created that pivotal moment, what role do we need to own? What role did we play? What is our responsibility in the co-creation or of those that came in the aftermath? Who might we extend forgiveness to today, knowing what we know now? What are we willing to let go of today? Or what higher awareness do we wish to carry forward from this particular pivotal experience. If you've been keeping journals or kept a journal of a particular military experience, career experience, or any particular single experience, you have an enviable record for jogging memories. For you, your timeline is somewhat already recorded. Consider rereading your journals with a nearby handful of color highlighters and begin to create your timeline. Consider highlighting specific events in one color and use another color for every time you discover a reflection. Now, what counts as a reflection? Anything that refers to how you felt or reacted to a particular situation. If it answers the question, how did it make you feel? Highlight that sucker. 
What time gives us is the advantage of perspective, like playing Monday morning quarterback, that knowing what you know now, in other words, how did that situation make you feel both during the moment and in the years that followed? And if you decide one day to write fiction, reading about your own reflections now will help you build depth for your future fictional characters. For example, how did it feel in that recorded moment to experience fear, shame, humiliation, love, joy, happiness, worthiness, vindication, or empowerment? Those feelings can be transferred to your fictional characters. And explore this possibility in your writing. Why did you, or your fictional protagonist, feel this way during that pivotal moment? In other words, what about the life that came before that moment caused you, or your fictional protagonist, to feel fear, or shame, or humiliation, happiness, joy, worthiness, vindication, or empowerment? Besides jogging memory of your life's pivotal moments through the creation of timelines or by rereading journals, consider looking at old photographs or home movies. In her essay, Memory Sky, for my book Red, White, and True, Amber Jensen, wife of an Iraq War veteran, reflects on the power of photographs. Here's an excerpt about the reflection of one in particular. Quote, Grandpa Dayton had always been a source of questions for me. I knew him from black and white photos and fragments of stories sprinkled here and there at holiday meals and afternoon coffee like powdered sugar over brownies. Blake knew Grandpa Dayton only from my versions of those stories, and yet Blake understood Dayton in ways I could not. Once, noticing a small black and white photo tucked in a china closet, Blake said, Dayton was a first sergeant. You never told me that. I'd never told him because I hadn't known. The patch on his uniform, Blake explained. First sergeant, that really meant something, especially in those days. I had studied that photo for years, hoping to gain some understanding of the mysterious man who died so young, so long before I was born. I had memorized the slope of Grandpa Dayton's nose, the droop of his eyes, and his faint smile lines. But in a glance, Blake had made meaning from the photo and established a connection. To Blake, it was a simple, objective interpretation. Of course, we've all seen the poignant images of families at the Vietnam War Memorial gently etching onto paper the name of a loved one. Images are powerful. Images have the ability to catapult us backward in time. Just when you think you've forgotten a voice, a smell, the unrelenting rain of a summer afternoon, the memories flood forward again. This is why we love taking photographs. We're preserving a moment because memory sadly fades unless it is born of tragedy. Even the happiest memories tend to fade too quickly. How about letters? Letters are another way to jog memory. Perhaps you're fortunate enough to have a parent or grandparent who, while they wouldn't talk much perhaps about their childhood or even military service had they served, left behind clues in the letters they sent home. Even in the absences between sentences, you might find creative ways to relate, reflect, and compare another family member's experience with your own. If you are writing about your own life, you become a reporter in a sense who is curious to know all that's possible to know about the life that led up to the beginning of, well, you. So take Beverly Jackson, for example, who never knew her father. Her father was a tail gunner on a B-17 during World War II when his plane was shot down over France. Beverly's mother would eventually remarry, and Beverly's stepfather didn't welcome talk about Beverly's father. Many years later, in fact not until after her mother's death, Beverly started an intense search to learn more about her biological father. 
thanks to the internet and to the encouragement of friends, Beverly flew to a small village in France, and the villagers provided her a hero's welcome. They took her to the wing shed, which is made in part from the wing of her father's plane. Quote, we have parked the cars off an isolated farm road to visit the wing shed. It is an old-fashioned lean-to, long abandoned, really just two walls on some poles stuck in the soil. Its weathered walls are pale gray metal constructed from their prize, the wing of the big bitch. After decades of hard winters, the metal structure cants perilously, sinking in tall weeds. A somber little group of nine, we congregate on a muddy cow path alongside an irrigation ditch. Huddled under umbrellas in the spring rain of Brittany, we have to cross an irrigation ravine to get to the shed, which, after 65 years, is bonded to its surroundings. Grass sprouts from the crevices of its seams. Under this flat gray sky, I feel like a melancholy child in my old body, a woman close to 70. A father could not recognize his child in this gauzy light, unquote. Oh, how lovely was that. So are you ready to embark upon your own journey of self-discovery? Are you ready to create a few timelines? Are you ready to read old journals or perhaps start a new one? Are there old photographs and letters you're remembering pushed at the back of an old drawer or perhaps in boxes pushed in the corner of an attic? Go ahead get started. I'll be right here wishing you the most benevolent outcome with all your self-discoveries and I invite you to contact me for support as needed along the way. I hope you enjoyed today's co-creative listening experience. Please remember to leave a comment about the single greatest takeaway for you today. You know, that one thing you will remember from this day forward. Was it something funny or provocative? Was it just what you needed to hear? Please share so we can all benefit. And remember to return Tuesdays and Thursdays to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life.